Okay, good morning. Good morning, everyone. How are you this morning? Uh, it's good to be with you. It's good to be here. Uh, this morning, we find ourselves in the second half of the statements known as the Beatitudes. So far, we've hit the first four, and this is what it sounds like. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And what we've done in this series thus far, continually, is we've pointed out that these words from Jesus, specifically these four statements, are backward. They don't make sense to the value system and the ways of our world. It doesn't make sense to find riches while impoverished. It doesn't make sense to know joy while dealing with sorrow. It doesn't make sense to know power when made weak. It doesn't make sense to know what is just when we give up our pursuit of being right in this world. The reality is for us, Jesus' Beatitudes don't make sense. They don't make sense. Or at least they don't lead us to thinking that one would experience the blessed life, the, the ultimate goal that Jesus is leading us to understand that the Beatitudes lead us to. We wouldn't experience the blessed life while dealing with difficult situations like poverty or grief or lack of power or being emptied of the world's justice. These statements that Jesus makes don't make sense in a very conditional world that lead us to believe, lead us to think that if we do a certain thing, if we live in a certain way, we'll be rewarded with the good life or the blessed life. This is why we wrestle with these words, because they don't make sense to us. They're countercultural to us. The good life, the blessed life that Jesus speaks to in Matthew chapter 5, it's not based on anything that makes sense in this world. It's not based on any of our own merit, but is granted when you are emptied of the ways and the values of this world. Knowing the blessings of the kingdom. Jesus says in the first four statements, begins with emptying yourself of the pursuits of this world. This doesn't make sense. And one of the things that I've come to understand about the Beatitudes thus far in our series is that the blessings of the kingdom of God, the blessings that, of God's presence, doesn't come for those with any merit, but comes to those who find themselves in rough situations. Poverty, grief, lack of power being emptied of worldly justice. The first four Beatitudes are less about us, less about us doing something, and more of us being something. These words have presented the way toward blessing. The way toward living the good life is simply being emptied. Being emptied is where you are blessed. Not because of anything that you do or because of anything that you've done, or said, but because of who you are in the eyes of God. When we read the Beatitudes, we hear words of being emptied of the ways and the values of this world, and after you've come to that place of emptiness, this is what Jesus announces. Mercy. Mercy is this underlying current through the first four statements of the Beatitudes, because in each of these difficult situations, being emptied of this world, being spiritually bankrupt, dealing with grief, being powerless, being without righteousness, Jesus proclaims blessings, mercy to those who are emptied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Because of who God is, not by what we do, we know mercy. And like we did last week, we need to spend a little time understanding what the word mercy and what the concept of mercy is before we're able to speak to our role as being merciful. This morning we need to ask the question, what is mercy really? What does it mean to receive mercy when you're emptied of all things? What does it mean that the merciful will receive mercy? Now if you just Google mercy, you find a definition like this, compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm which sounds really nice. It sounds really nice that, that, that you get a second chance, you get a third chance. Even though you don't deserve it, you get it. But in our worlds, 
what sounds nice doesn't always manifest itself. We don't know mercy well in this world. We know grudges and judgment and outrage. We know a world that shows punishment first towards someone who's, whom it's within power to punish or harm. We know a world of road rage. We know a world of a lack of patience. We know a world filled with revenge much better than we understand a world filled with mercy. We like to talk about mercy and compassion and forgiveness. The world, we like to give second chance. We like to talk about that all the time. But seeing it actually take place in our world, let alone it playing out in our own lives, is rare. Now, we use the word mercy a lot in the church. We say things like, Lord, have mercy after a prayer. Or I'll mention the word mercy alongside words like grace and love in a sermon. But outside the walls of the church, beyond Sundays, mercy is not a word that we use often, and it's not, an ex- it's not something that we experience very often. Generally speaking, we like the concept of forgiveness and compassion as society as a whole, We like to think that we can be people of mercy. We like to think that we are a culture of mercy. That we can be people who fully embrace the reality that our failures don't define us. That your failures don't define you. But we certainly don't see a whole lot of that lived out as defined by our Google machine. Our world is one that often seems to be stripped of mercy. And it's with that understanding of mercy in 2020 we find Jesus saying these words, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now coming off of the heels of the four statements, speaking to the importance of being emptied of the ways and the values of this world, in this beatitude, Jesus proclaims mercy. Mercy to those who are emptied. Mercy to the unearned, unmerited uh, people who, who receive forgiveness and grace and blessings for those who have been emptied of all the ways and the things of this world. Jesus proclaims God's presence to those who are bankrupt of the things of this world. To those people, he proclaims his word of mercy. God's mercy and blessings are for those dealing with physical and spiritual poverty. God's mercy and blessings are with those whose spirit is crushed. God's mercy and blessings are for those whose hearts are broken. God's mercy and blessings are those of the powerless. God's mercy and blessings are with those whose heart aches for wholeness and true righteousness. God's mercy and blessings are with those who let go of the ways and the values of this world, including the outrage, including the vendettas, including our desire to judge others. God's mercy and blessings are with all of those who are emptied of all of that. God's mercy is the thing that's proclaimed in the midst of our emptiness. Mercy is the underlying current throughout the Beatitudes. It Really, it's the underlying current throughout the gospel. As former guitarist of the band Delirious and songwriter Ju- Stu Gerard says, Receiving mercy is like having a crushing weight lifted off your chest. It's like a fresh air bursting into suffocating lungs. After four weeks of talking about being emptied and feeling like, okay, all I got to do is just be emptied, we finally hear for the very first time Jesus proclaim what it means to be filled. And I love Gerard's words. It's like fresh air bursting into suffocating lungs. When we're emptied of the things of this world, when we're weighed down by the heaviness of this world, when we find ourselves at the bottom, bankrupt, that, that is the place where we experience the undercurrent of the whole story of God. That is where we experience mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Pope Francis, back in his Easter sermon at the Vatican in 2013, said, God's mercy can make even the driest land become a garden, it can restore life to dry bones. That is mercy. That is the proclamation of mercy in the midst of emptiness that Jesus gives to the people listening to him. Now, while Jesus puts this statement in the very middle of the Beatitudes, don't miss this fact that mercy is 
probably, in my estimation, one of the most dominant characteristics of God in dealing with people. Mercy is a part of literally everything that God does. The psalmist states this best in Psalm 145. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. Hear this. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. Again, understanding the concept of mercy, understanding this, that the compassion and forgiveness shown towards someone or to a group of people whom with it's within one's power to punish or harm them, you have to understand that that, that is the, the definition that God uses here. God's tender mercies are over all of his works. From the very beginning of the story, God's mercy is on display in the first words of the scripture. As God shows compassion to Adam and Eve in their rebellion when they deserve punishment, they were granted life. Mercy is shown to the Israelites on the base of the mountain in Exodus as they construct this golden calf as a, as a, spot of, uh, as a show of their idol, as a God for them. This single act of disobedience broke the first commandment. This simple, single, single act of disobedience, it broke the first commandment. What's the deal? You deserve, you deserve to be punished. You broke the covenant. The penalty for you should be death, yet in God's great mercy, because of God's heart for forgiveness and compassion, God grants life. Mercy is shown to Ruth. Even though she's found herself on the outside looking in, she is made right in the eyes of God and is shown abundant mercy. Through the time of the judges, we know time after time the people of Israel reject God's ways and to make them right again, what does God do? He doesn't punish them. He brings up another leader. He brings up another judge to be God's presence for them, to be God's mercy for them, righting what they had wronged. As they found themselves in exile, the Israelites, because of what they did, because of their own disobedience, God doesn't keep them in exile. What does God do? God makes a path for them to return back to their land. Compassion on top of compassion. The Old Testament story is a story of compassion on top of compassion. It's forgiveness on top of forgiveness. It's mercy on top of mercy. Mercy, God's forgiveness and compassion, are rooted in literally everything that God does. It's in the very movement and action of God. God's law commands it in the scripture. The wisdom literature, it teaches it. The prophets direct the people toward it, and the Psalms highlight it over and over again. Yet that is not the fullest expression of God's mercy, for in the New Testament, the fullest expression of the mercy of God is found in the work and the person of Jesus Christ. The compassion of God, the mercy of God incarnate. While mercy is on full display throughout the Old Testament, mercy is made to be something more in the New Testament through Jesus. For those Jesus interacted with, the sinner, the outsider, the sick, the broken, the widows, the downtrodden, the marginalized, Jesus was the embodiment of mercy. Jesus was the very person of compassion. He was forgiveness in real life. Jesus was the presence of God's divine mercy in person. When people encountered Jesus, they didn't just encounter a person, they encountered mercy. Jesus is the good Samaritan that he speaks of who never ignored the suffering of any spiritual or material need. Jesus drew close to the broken. He became mercy for, with wounds, for, for those wounds, and, and he, heals, he heals wounds with his hands. He became mercy. He took care of people. Jesus, God's son, became a human in order to have hands with which to heal and show compassion to the hurting. Jesus' whole life points toward mercy. He forgives the sins of the paralytic who is lowered on a stretcher from the roof of the house where he's staying. He raises up and restores to his mother the only son of the widow of name. 
He miraculously feeds the hungry crowds that followed him. What moved Jesus in all of these situations is simply the, the idea of mercy. Church, what we find in Jesus is that in order to extend mercy, God realized, had this plan to become mercy. It wasn't this far-off thing that, he, that God was doing throughout the Old Testament. No, it became a personal thing. What we find in Jesus is that in order to extend mercy, God had to be close to the broken. He had to draw near to the hurting and the downtrodden. He had to become like those who were empty. Jesus' unconditional love and mercy reach its maximum expression in this passion. He became one of us so that he could be forgiveness for humanity. As he was even nailed to the cross and hung on this hill, he is moved to compassion. He's moved to mercy as he's hearing the thief confess next to him, saying, we indeed are under the sentence of condemnation justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. And he turns to Jesus while hanging and he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now Jesus, in that moment, he could have fully just been in his own world. He could have and it would have made sense. He was hanging there close to death. But he hangs there and he hears and he responds immediately with the expression of perfect mercy. Jesus accepts the petition made by the thief who is in need of love and admits the sin in his life in all its simplicity. He forgives him. On the spot, while, while dealing with the agony, he forgives him. He, he, he opens the door to the kingdom because he was mercy. Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus, in his darkest hour, still shows what he'd come and he'd come for moments like that to be mercy. Jesus had come to stand before someone who des deserved punishment because of what they did or what they said. Jesus had come to be mercy. Instead of doling out a completely warranted punishment, Jesus forgives. And Jesus opens the door of the kingdom. Instead of punishment, instead of judgment, Jesus hands out blessings. Jesus came to be mercy. He came to be unconditional mercy. And that's really incredible <laughs> to take in. He was that for people face to face when he lived, but he's still that today. Jesus was, is, and will forever be the embodiment of mercy because like the thief on the cross hanging next to him, we deserve the punishment that 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 man deserved for our rebellion and for our rejection of God's ways. Yet just as he did then, he continues to say to us today, truly you will be with me in paradise. In me, you know mercy. In me, you experience forgiveness and compassion. In me, you will know grace and love. In me, you will be filled in your brokenness and your emptiness with mercy. Church, that is good news. I know I can't see your faces, but that's good news, church. To remind you of Stu Gerard's words, receiving mercy is like having a crushing weight lifted off your chest. It's like fresh air bursting into suffocating lungs. That is incredible news, church. We don't have to do anything in order to know mercy. We don't have to do anything to justify our words or actions to be forgiven. What Jesus does is says, it's free. It's the result of who I am because of how I love you. It's the coming to understanding that nothing in this life feels like the mercy of Jesus. It's admitting to ourselves and crying out like the thief on the cross, Jesus, I need your mercy. And Jesus had come for that. He freely gives it. But that's not what this fifth beatitude is all about, is it? It's not just simply about receiving mercy. 
yes, God's mercy is given to us without merit. That is good news because we deserve far less. But to understand this beatitude just as a gift for us in the church or us on Team Jesus is really missing something important because it doesn't paint the full picture of what Jesus' few words in the statement say. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are those who are filled with mercy and extend that mercy. Blessed are those who show mercy, for they shall know mercy. Blessed are those who forgive, for they shall be forgiven. Blessed are those who offer compassion, for they will be shown compassion. Jesus isn't saying here, isn't mercy great? Isn't my forgiveness wonderful? Just sit back and relax and live life basking in the free gift of my compassion. No, Jesus says, blessed are those who know my mercy and show my mercy. For in showing my mercy, this gets confusing, for showing my mercy to others, they will know my mercy in their lives. When you show my mercy, you will know my mercy. This is a carousel that goes round and round and round. We receive mercy, we show mercy, and when we receive mercy, we are found to be showing mercy. Blessed are those who extend mercy, for they will, be know, they will know mercy. Church, don't miss this. God so desperately wants us to grow in and be example of this important characteristic today. It's, it's all throughout the scriptures. The prophet Hosea says, for I desire mercy and not sacrifice. That's God through the prophet Hosea. Mercy is one of those traits that God specifically requires for those to embody if they're committed to following God in their lives. And this truth shows up time after time. This is one of the verses that we know. Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Jesus in the Gospel of Luke says, Therefore be merciful just as your Father also is merciful. And later on in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus called mercy one of the, the weightier matters of the law. Mercy, like what we find in the Beatitudes, is yes, it's this continual undercurrent of the Gospel. Really, it's the continual undercurrent of the whole story of God. And it is vital for us to understand we receive mercy because of what Jesus does. But we can't just be people who know mercy. We have to be people who show mercy. We have to follow Jesus' example in extending mercy in all we do. Therefore, we have to be willing to take up, like Jesus, to take up the practice of coming close, coming near, drawing near to those who are such in desperate need of mercy in their lives. Yes, we can do that with our kids and our family and our friends, especially when they do something wrong, because you know that they will. But this isn't limited to that. This is so, something so much more. This is a calling to put ourselves in the messes of this world. This is a calling to pursue after the hearts of the broken and the sinful. This is a calling to, to draw near, like Jesus, to the downtrodden and the outcast. For if we want to be filled with the things of God after being emptied of the things of this world, Jesus says this is where it starts. Do you want to experience true mercy? Do you desire to be filled because of Jesus' true forgiveness, true compassion? If so, Jesus says you have to be willing to draw near to those broken in order to extend mercy. For in extending mercy, you will receive mercy. In order to extend mercy, we have to draw near to the broken just as Jesus has drawn near to us. In order to extend mercy, we are required to act differently than the way the world would and stand up for those who need mercy and be a witness to mercy of Christ for others who desperately need to experience it. There is a world outside of these walls that is such in desperate need of compassion, and forgiveness. It's a need of mercy, which simply has me coming to the question, what, how, do, how do we live out a life of extending mercy in this crazy world? This crazy world of grudges and judgment and finger pointing and name calling. How do we do it? 
I want to highlight one more example of Jesus' mercy for you that I think perfectly depicts my perspective or our perspective what we're called to be and called to do to extend mercy. These are the words from the Gospel of John, starting in chapter 8. Early in the morning, Jesus came to the temple courts again. All the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The experts in the law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught committing adultery. They made her stand in front of them and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us were to stone her to death. What then do you say? Now, they were asking this. This is in parentheses. They were asking this in an attempt to trap him so they could bring charges against him. Jesus bent down and wrote on the ground with his finger. When they persisted in asking him, he stood up straight and replied, Whoever among you is guiltless may be the first to throw a stone at her. Then he bent over again and wrote on the ground. Now when they heard this, they began to drift away one at a time, starting with the older ones, until Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up straight and said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She replied, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go, and from now on, do not sin anymore. Church, we see this story play out before us. Time after time, maybe it's not like this, but it is in many ways like this. Someone screws up, and the finger pointing, or the online bullying, or the name calling starts up. And what Jesus says cuts through all of that, because the reality of our world is that Every single one of us has done wrong. Every single one of us has sinned. Each of us is like this woman. Each of us deserves her fate at the hands of the Pharisees that day. Yet, because of Jesus' mercy for us, we know life. We know that weight lifted off of our chest. We know the fresh air breathed into our gasping lungs. Each of us is dead in our sin and cannot escape that reality without the mercy of Christ. All of us have been granted that mercy. But all of us have been granted that mercy in order to extend that mercy to someone else. I think Tony said it really well this week in her prayer email. There's no one that we'll encounter today on our Facebook feed, at our workplace, or for her in an event parking lot, who is not in need of mercy. That's true. And you and I, she continues to say, you and I have the privilege of extending it to them because Christ has secured irrevocable mercy for us. We have received mercy. That is really great news. But we have received that mercy to be mercy. Not only that, but we should receive that mercy and be swept up in the, the current to take that mercy to those everywhere hurting and broken who are in such desperate need of mercy. This world, like that woman in John chapter 8, it's broken down because of the weight of the brokenness and the sin and the despair. In order for us, though, to extend mercy of Jesus, what the fifth beatitude says is you have to draw near to you have to be drawn near to the broken. It's like Jesus, right? Drawing a line in the sand. And Jesus says, draw the line in the sand, but draw it in the sand for those who are hurting and for those who are broken. Be a witness to mercy in this world. Draw the line and say, we're going to stand up for those who need mercy. A Christian lawyer and author, Brian Stevenson, in his book, Just Mercy, compels us to be merciful to the accused and pay attention to how we extend mercy in our lives. And he says this, Today our self-righteousness, our fear, and our anger has caused even the Christians to hurl stones at the people who fall down. 
even when we know we should forgive or show compassion, we can't simply watch that happen. Listen to this, church. He says we have to be stone catchers. We have to be stone catchers in this world. Throwing stones. A stone catcher, someone who catches the stones thrown by the merciless, someone who catches the stones thrown by the unjust, someone who catches the stones thrown by those in power, someone who catches the stones thrown because someone else caught our stones. Isn't that powerful? Like, does that give you goosebumps? We cannot be people who hurl stones in this world. There are too many people that do, do that. They're the ways of the world, that is what it does. We cannot be people who hurl stones at those who need compassion. We are called, it's deeply in our calling to be the people who catch the stones. Jesus was a stone catcher. Jesus drew new, near to people like the widow and the prostitute. He sat among the broken. He saw, saw and he heard and he healed. He caught the stones being hurled at people only because he drew new, near to them. Church, this fifth beatitude, blessed are the merciful for they will receive mercy, calls us to be stone catchers for those who are beaten down and broken by the lack of compassion and forgiveness in this world. You and I, by virtue of what Christ has done for us, are called to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. We have been the recipients of mercy to be mercy. We have been filled with mercy to be the hands and feet of mercy. We're not simply called to bask in the glow of mercy that Jesus extends to us, but to extend mercy in every single place we go to every single person we meet. We are to go to the places where people are broken down by the lack of mercy and be the hands and feet of mercy, to be the hands and feet of compassion, to be the hands and feet of forgiveness and grace and love. Jesus' call on our lives through his words is to seek after those who are in such desperate need to hear and experience that mercy that is such so void of, of anything that looks like the world to ex experience compassion and forgiveness that can only come through Christ. We are called to be stone catchers for this world because Jesus has first caught the stones thrown at us. We are called to lift the weight off of the chest of others so they may experience a burst of fresh air into their suffocating lungs. We are called to be mercy in this world that needs to know the mercy extended through the life of Jesus. So may we be people who drop our own stones of judgment and ridicule and hate in every place of our lives so that we might become stone catchers for others. May we be the hands and feet of mercy, lifting the heavy weight of the burden and the brokenness of this world off of the chests of others so they can experience the mercy, the fresh air of Jesus bursting into their suffocating lungs. May we be, in this world, mercy. May we find new life in that mercy that was extended to us first so that we can extend mercy and life to others. Today and every day, in this place and in every place we go, church.